Hello. That is my mother watching TV in the other room, if you can hear background noise. But I figure if I wait until <coughs> all I have is perfect silence, I'll never get any of these recordings done. So, bear with me. Alright, let's party. The Origin of Capitalism by Ellen Makesons Wood. Chapter 8 Capitalism and the Nation State. It is not uncommon to insist on the connections between the emergence of capitalism and the rise of the nation state or even to define capitalism, at least at its origin, as a system of nation-states. Typically, the connections are seen through the prism of one or another theory of, quote, modernity, or, quote, rationalization, according to which certain modern or rational economic, political, and cultural forms have developed more or less in tandem combining a process of urbanization and commercialization with the formation of a rational state. There are variations on this theme, such as Perry Anderson's suggestion, discussed in Chapter 2, that the emergence of the absolutist state in early modern Europe freed the bourgeois commercial economy from the dead hand of feudalism and landlordly power, separating political and economic spheres by concentrating sovereignty in a centralized state. Emmanuel Wallerstein, as we saw, suggests that the European nation-state, in sharp contrast to more advanced Asian empires, laid the foundations for capitalism because the organization of Europe into multiple polities, instead of in one overarching empire, permitted the development of a trade-based division of labor without the burden of massive appropriation by an imperial state that siphoned off surpluses that could otherwise have been invested. But the argument presented in this book requires us to look at the relation between the rise of capitalism and the nation-state somewhat differently. Bil building on the premises outlined so far, that capitalism was not simply the natural outcome of certain trans-historical processes like rationalization, technological progress, urbanization, or the expansion of trade, that its emergence required more than the removal of obstacles to increase trade and growing markets, or to the exercise of bourgeois rationality. That while certain European or Western European conditions, not least the insertion of Europe in a larger and non-European network of international trade, were necessary to its emergence. Those same conditions produced diverse effects in various European and even Western European cases, and that the necessary conditions for the, quote, spontaneous or indigenous and self-sustaining development of a capitalist system with mutually reinforcing agricultural and industrial sectors existed only in England. Sorry, new section is sip time. The sovereign territorial state in the pre-capitalist pre Europe 
the unity of economic and political power that characterized pre-capitalist states in which exploitation was carried out by extra economic means, that is, by means of political, judicial, and or military power, or politically constituted property, has, exist, has existed in a very wide variety of forms. Ancient empires where state power was employed to collect tribute from subject peoples, including their own peasants, and imperial office was the principal means of acquiring great wealth. The collective lordships of commercial city-states in medieval and early modern Europe, the early modern European absolutist state with its tax office structure, in which public office was a source of private wealth, achieved by extracting taxes, especially from peasants, and so on. The modern nation-state emerged out of a very particular pre-capitalist formation, a unity of political and economic power that took the form of a fragmented state power. The parcelized sovereignty of Western feudalism and its distinctive kind of, quote, extra economic power, feudal lordship. The fragmented military, political, and judicial powers of the state became the means by which individual lords extracted surpluses from peasants. At the same time, political parcelization was, as we have seen, matched by economic fragmentation, so that even internal trade, when it extended beyond very local peasant markets, was less like modern capitalist forms of trade in an integrated competitive market than like traditional forms of international commerce, circulating goods between separate markets. The parcelized sovereignty of feudalism represented a network of very local and personal social relations, which were at once political and economic. This certainly meant that the feudal system was very fragmented. But at the same time, it was in the very nature of these relations that there were no rigid territorial boundaries between one feudal nexus and another. A feudal kingdom constituted by a series of vertical relations of fealty, bondage, and personal coercive power, and horizontal relations of family and dynastic alliance, was likely to have fairly porous borders, which could be breached or moved by extending or contracting the network of personal bonds and domination. Just as the feudal trading network was not an integrated global system, but a series of conveyance and arbitrage operations, between one locale and another. Feudalism as a social system was an aggregation of personal and local networks with permeable or movable boundaries. In feudalism, then, the territorial boundaries of political sovereignty tended to be fluid, expanding or contracting with the reach of the lords or the monarchs personal rule, his proprietary domain, and family alliances. The feudal ruling class was eventually compelled to consolidate its fragmented political power in the face of peasant resistance and the plainly untenable disorder of aristocratic conflict. Parcelized sovereignty gave way to more centralized monarchies in some parts of Europe and to the modern nation-state. The centralizing monarchies of Europe 
created territorial states in which the central or let more the central more or less sovereign power exerted its predominant coercive force over a more or less well-defined territory. But the fluid boundaries of feudalism were never firmly fixed until personal rule was replaced by an impersonal state. And that could never be fully accomplished until the separation of the political and economic, the moments of appropriation and coercion, private property, and public power. That separation would be completed only in capitalism. It is certainly true that capitalism developed in the distinctive context of the early modern European state, which was not itself created by capitalism. Or to put it more precisely, capitalism developed in tandem with the process of state formation. But if feudalism was a precondition of capitalism, and if capitalism, with its separation of political and economic spheres, emerged in, the conjun in conjunction with a process of feudal centralization, the process of state formation took different forms in different places, and capitalism was only one of several outcomes of the transition from feudalism. While there were certain common preconditions, not all European or even Western European nations states developed in the same way. One path out of feudalism was absolutism, which had an economic logic quite distinct from capitalist forms of exploitation or capitalist laws of motion. Instead of producing a capitalist economy, Absolutism reproduced the pre-capitalist unity of political and economic power at the level of the central state, while never completely overcoming the parcelization of feudalism. The most notable example is the absolutist state in France, regarded by many as the prototype of the emerging modern nation-state. Formed in a process of state centralization that elevated one among many feudal powers to a position of monarchical dominance, French absolutism remained in many ways rooted in its feudal past. <coughs> Excuse me. On the one hand, the bureaucracy that is supposed to be the mark of the French state's modernity represented a structure of offices used by office holders as a form of private property, a means of appropriating peasant-produced surpluses, what has been called a kind of centralized feudal rent, in the form of taxation. Property in office even came to be recognized in law as heritable and alienable, like any other private property. <laughs> Sorry, I knew that's gross. I don't know if I'm getting sick or uh, just got a little congestion. This was a mode of appropriation very different in its means and in its rules for reproduction from capitalist exploitation depending on direct coercion to squeeze out more surpluses up from the direct producers instead of on intensifying exploitation by enhancing labor productivity. On the other hand, the absolutist state never completely displaced other forms of politically constituted property. It always lived side by side and in tension with other more fragmented forms, the remnants of feudal parcelized sovereignty. Aristocrats, the church, and municipalities clung to their old autonomous powers, military, political, or judicial. 
even when these powers were fatally weakened by state centralization and no longer represented a fragment of parcelized sovereignty. They often continued to serve as a fiercely protected, occasionally revived or even invented source of income for their possessors. At the same time, the central state, competing for the same peasant-produced surpluses, typically co-opted many potential competitors by giving them state office, exchanging one kind of politically constituted property for another. But the remnants of aristocratic privilege and municipal jurisdiction, together with the tensions among various forms of politically constituted property, remain to the end just as much a part of French absolutism as was the centralized monarchy. Notwithstanding France's bourgeois, in quotes, revolution, we cannot take for granted France's, quote, spontaneous evolution into capitalism. In the absence of external pressures from an already existing English capitalism, Elsewhere in Europe, the fragmentation of property and polity were even more marked. And everywhere, these fragmented forms of politically constituted property, like the centralized version, represented a mode of appropriation antithetical to capitalism. They were inimical to capitalism also because they fragmented the economy as well as the state, with their separate local and municipal markets, not to mention internal trade barriers, characterized not by capitalist competition, but by the old forms of commercial profit-taking in the sphere of circulation. To put it another way, the parcelization of sovereignty and the parcelization of markets were two sides of the same coin, rooted in the same property relations. New section. Water break. Now coffee break. The state in capitalist England. The development of capitalism and the nation state were intertwined in England in a very particular way. England was not, of course, alone in producing a sovereign territorial state, but it was, in the first instance, alone in producing a capitalist system. At the same time, the process that gave rise to English capitalism was accompanied by the development of a more clearly defined territorial sovereignty than in other European nation-states. Although capitalism did not give rise to the nation-state, and the nation-state did not give rise to capitalism, the social transformations that brought about capitalism with its characteristic separation of economic and political spheres, were the same ones that brought the nation-state to maturity. England never had the same degree of parcelization that existed in the rest of feudal Europe. The fragmentation of both economy and polity was overcome first and most completely here. Even in the Middle Ages, when England had what appeared to be a thoroughly feudal system of property, in which the law recognized, quote, no land without its lord, end quote, lordship did not carry the same autonomous political power that it had elsewhere, and the monarchy developed in tandem rather than in competition with the aristocracy. 
Of course, there were episodes of baronial conflict. But when the monarchy and propertied classes came to blows most dramatically in the 17th century civil war, it was not a conflict between different forms of politically constituted property or even between competing sites of sovereignty, but rather a battle over control of an already centralized sovereign state. Because the king was upsetting the balance between the crown and parliament, breaching the traditional alliance summed up in the old formula, quote, the crown in parliament, end quote. England's particular process of feudal centralization produced a legal and political order more unified than was the European norm. So, for instance, while France, even at the height of its absolutist centralization, still had its regional estates, England had long had a unitary national parliament, and when France even up until the revolution, had some 360 local law codes, England had a more nationally unified legal system, especially its, quote, common law, adjudicated by royal courts, which had become the preferred and dominant legal system very early in the development of the English state. The unity was not simply a matter of political or legal unification. Its corollary was a distinctive degree of economic unification. Already in the 17th century, there was something like a national economy, an integrated and increasingly competitive national market centered on London. Both political and economic unity can be traced to the same source. The centralization of the state in England was not based on a feudal unity of economic and political power. The state did not represent a private resource for office holders in the way or on the scale that it did in France. Nor did the state on the whole have to compete with other forms of politically constituted property. Instead, state formation took the form of a cooperative project, a kind of division of labor between political and economic power, between the monarchical state and the aristocratic ruling class, between a central political power that enjoyed a virtual monopoly of coercive force much earlier than others in Europe, and an economic power based on private property and land more concentrated than elsewhere in Europe. Here, then, was the separation between the moment of coercion and the moment of appropriation, allocated between two distinct but complementary, quote, spheres that uniquely characterizes capitalist exploitation. English landlords increasingly depended on purely economic forms of exploitation, while the state maintained order and enforced the whole system of property. Instead of enhancing their own coercive powers to squeeze more out of peasants, Landlords relied on the coercive power of the state to sustain the whole system of property. While they exercised their purely economic power, their concentrated land holdings to increase the productivity of labor in conditions where appropriators and producers were both becoming increasingly market dependent. The weakness of politically constituted property in England, in other words, meant both the rise of capitalism and the evolution of a truly sovereign and unified national state. It also meant a more sharply defined territorial polity, just as the separation of the political 
and the economic and capitalism ended the contestation of sovereignty among competing sites of extra-economic power, so it helped to fix the state's territorial borders by detaching them from the fluctuating fortunes of personal property and dynastic connections. There were, to sum up, two sides to the historical relation between capitalism and the nation-state. On the one hand, that state was not itself produced by capitalism. The modern state, together with modern conceptions of territoriality and sovereignty, emerged out of social relations that had nothing to do with capitalism. In the tensions between parcelized sovereignties and centralizing monarchies. On the other hand, the rise of capitalism, which took place in the context of a rising nation-state, brought that state to fruition. Or to put it more precisely, the particular form of English state formation belonged to the same process that brought about capitalism. The transformation of politically constituted property into capitalist property was at the same time and inseparably a transformation of the state. A state with an unambiguous sovereign power over a clearly defined territory did not come completely into its own until capitalist property had displaced pre-capitalist modes of appropriation. Sorry, I gotta repeat that because I'm spacing out. A state with an unambiguous sovereign power over a clearly defined territory did not come completely into its own until capitalist property had displaced pre-capitalist modes of appropriation. That is, until capitalist property, dis property displaced both parcelized sovereignty and the fragmented economy associated with politically constituted property. The territorial nation-state was part of a more general European process of state formation, but a clearly defined territorial state with a truly sovereign power matured only when political sovereignty became both separate from and allied with a national economy. Capitalism and International Relations For those who regard capitalism as the consequence of commercial expansion when it reached a critical mass, there is something paradoxical about the development of English capitalism. <sighs> Sorry, I'm spacing out again. What the fuck? Being a little punk. Capitalism and International Relations For those who regard capitalism as the consequence of commercial expansion when it reached a critical mass, there is something paradoxical about the development of capitalism. England was certainly part of a vast trading network, but other European nations in the early modern period, modern period were also deeply involved in the system of international trade, as were non-European civilizations, some of which long had trading networks more highly developed and extensive than the European. What distinguished England, and what was specifically capitalist about England, was not in the first instance predominance as a trading nation or any peculiarity in its way of con deducting foreign trade. England's peculiarity was not its role in an outwardly expanding commercial system. On the contrary, England's inward development 
the growth of a unique domestic economy. I'm going to say that again. England's peculiarity was not its role in an outwardly expanding commercial system, but on the contrary, its inward development, the growth of a unique domestic economy. What marked off England's commercial system from others was a single large and integrated national market increasingly uniting the country into one economic unit, which eventually embraced the British Isles as a whole. With a specialized division of labor, among interdependent regions and a growing and mutually reinforcing interaction between agricultural and industrial sectors. While England competed with others in an expanding system of international trade, not least by military means, a new kind of commercial system was emerging at home, which would soon give it an advantage on the international plane too. This system was unique in its dependence on intensive as distinct from extensive expansion. On the extraction of surplus value created in production as distinct from profit in the sphere of circulation, on economic growth based on increasing productivity and competition within a single market, in other words, on capitalism. Capitalism, then, while it certainly developed within and could not have developed without an international system of trade, was a domestic product. But it, was not lo- not, but it was not in the nature of capitalism to remain at home for long. Its need for endless accumulation, on which its very survival depended, produced new and distinctive imperatives of expansion. These imperatives operated at various levels. The most obvious level these p- imperatives operated on was, of course, the imperialist drive. Here again, Although other European states were deeply involved in imperialism, capitalism had a transformative effect. The new requirements of capitalism created new imperialist needs. And it was British capitalism that produced an imperialism answering to the specific requirements of capitalist accumulation. Above all, capitalism created new imperialist possibilities by generating economic imperatives, the compulsions of the market, which could reach far beyond direct political dominion. Direct political dominion. (laughs) That was my tongue that wasn't a fart, I swear to God. (laughs) Oh man, the farts I hold in while reading these books. Where the hell was I? Capitalism also expanded out from Britain in another and more complicated sense. The unique productivity engendered by capitalism, especially in its industrial form, gave Britain new advantages not only in its old commercial rivalries with other European states, but also in their military conflicts. So from the late 18th century, and especially in the 19th, Britain's major European rivals were under pressure to develop their economies in ways that could meet this new challenge. The state itself became a major player. This was true most notably in Germany, with Germany's state-led industrialization which in the first instance was undoubtedly driven more by older geopolitical and military considerations than by capitalist motivations. In such cases, the drive for capitalist development did not come from internal property relations, 
like those that impel the development of capitalism in England from within. Whereas in France and Germany, there was an adequate concentration of productive forces, capitalism could develop in response to external pressures emanating from an already existing capitalist system elsewhere. States still following a pre-capitalist logic could become effective agents of capitalist development. The point here, however, is not simply that in these later developing capitalisms, as in many others after them, the state played a primary role. What is even more striking is the ways in which the traditional pre-capitalist state system, together with, the, together with the old commercial network, became a transmission belt for capitalist imperatives. The European state system, then, was a conduit for the first outward movement of capitalism. From then on, capitalism spread outward from Europe, both by means of imperialism and increasingly by means of economic imperatives. The role of the state in imperial ventures is obvious, but even in the operation of purely economic laws of motion, the state continued to be an unavoidable medium. Capitalism had emerged first in one country. After that, it could never emerge again in the same way. Every extension of capitalism's laws of motion changed the conditions of development thereafter, and every local context shaped the process of change. But having once begun in a single nation-state, and having been followed by other nationally organized processes of economic development, capitalism had spread not by erasing national boundaries, but by reproducing its national organization, creating an increasing number of national economies and nation-states. The inevitably uneven development of separate, if interrelated, national entities, especially when subject to imperatives of competition, has virtually guaranteed the persistence of national forms. Capitalism and the nation-state. Although the world today is more than ever a world of nation-states, we are constantly being told that global expansion of capitalism has ruptured its historic association with the nation-state. <coughs> the state, we are assured, is being pushed aside by, quote, globalization and transnational forces. But like, but, excuse me, but while no one would deny the global reach of capital, there is little evidence that today's global capital is less in need of national states than were earlier capitalist interests. Global capital, no less than national capital, relies on nation states to maintain local conditions favorable to accumulation, as well as to help it navigate the global economy. It might, then, be more accurate to say that globalization is characterized less by the decline of the nation-state than by a growing contradiction between the global scope of capital and its persistent need for more local and national forms of, quote, extra economic support. A growing disparity between its economic reach and its political grasp. We can also we can make sense of this contradiction by looking more closely at the historic separation 
between the economic and the political in capitalism, in contrast to earlier forms. The pre-capitalist unity of economic and political powers, such as that of feudal lordship, meant, among other things, that the economic powers of the feudal lord could never extend beyond the reach of his personal ties or alliances and extra-economic powers, his military force, political rule, or judicial authority. Nor, for that matter, could the economic powers of the absolutist state or any pre-capitalist empire exceed its extra-economic range. Hope I read that paragraph right. <laughs> Unlike other systems of exploitation in which appropriating classes or states extract surplus labor from producers by direct coercion, capitalist exploitation is characterized by a division of labor between the economic moment of appropriation and the extra economic or political moment of coercion. Underlying this separation is the market dependence of all economic actors, appropriators and producers, which generates economic imperatives distinct and apart from direct political coercion. This separation, which creates two distinct spheres, each with its own dynamics, its own temporalities, and its own spatial range is both a source of strength and a source of contradiction. On the one hand, the distinctive division of labor between the economic and political moments of capitalism and between economic imperatives and political coercion makes possible capitalism's unique capacity for universalization and spatial expansion. Capital is not only uniquely driven to extend its economic reach, but also uniquely able to do so. The self-expansion of capital is not limited to what the capitalist can squeeze out of the direct producers by direct coercion, nor is capital accumulation confined within the spatial range of personal domination. By means of specifically economic market imperatives, capital is uniquely able to escape the limits of direct coercion and move far beyond the borders of political authority. This makes possible both its distinctive forms of class domination and its particular forms of imperialism. By means of specifically economic market imperatives, capital is uniquely able to escape the limits of direct coercion. Yeah, sorry, my brain keeps fucking farting. I'll shut up. The self expansion of capital is not limited to what the capitalist can squeeze out of the direct producers by direct coercion, nor is capital accumulation confined within the spatial range of personal domination. By means of specifically economic market imperatives, capital is uniquely able to escape the limits of direct coercion and move far beyond the borders of political authority. This makes possible both its distinctive forms of class domination and its particular forms of imperialism. On the other hand, while the scope of capitalist economic imperatives can far outreach direct political rule and legal authority, the same disjunction that makes this possible is the root of an irreducible contradiction. The economic imperatives of capitalism are always in need of support by extra-economic powers of regulation and coercion to create and sustain the conditions of accumulation and maintain the system of capitalist property. 
The transfer of certain political powers to capital can never eliminate the need to retain others in a formally separate political sphere, preserving the division between the moment of economic appropriation and the moment of political coercion. Nor can purely economic imperatives ever completely supplant direct political coercion, or indeed survive at all without political support. In fact, capitalism, in some ways more than any other social form, needs politically organized and legally defined stability, regularity, and predictability in its social arrangements. Yet these are conditions of capital's existence and self-reproduction that it cannot provide for itself and that its own inherent anarchic laws of motion constantly subvert. To stabilize capitalism's constitutive social relations between capital and labor, or capital and other capitals, capitalism is especially reliant on legally defined and politically authorized regularities. Business transactions at every level require consistency and reliable enforcement. In contractual relations, monetary standards, exchanges of property. The coercions that sustain these regularities must exist apart from capital's own powers of appropriation if it is to preserve its capacity for self-expansion. Capitalist transactions also require an elaborate infrastructure that its own profit-maximizing imperatives are ill-equipped to provide. And finally, in a system of market dependence, access to the means of subsistence is subject to the vagaries of the market, especially for the property of this majority, whose access even to the means of labor depends on selling their labor power. A system like this, where the economy has been, quote, disembedded from other social relations, will also have a distinctive need for politically organized social provision, even just to keep people alive through times when they cannot sell their labor power and to ensure a, quote, reserve army of workers. This means that capitalism remains dependent on extra economic conditions, political and legal supports. Until now, no one has found a more effective means of supplying those supports than the political form with which capitalism has been historically, if not causally connected, the old nation state. As much as global capital might like a corresponding global state, the kind of day-to-day -day stability regularity and predictability required for capital accumulation is inconceivable on anything like a global scale. To be sure, there does exist a military power whose scope is as close to global as the world has ever seen. As this edition goes to press, the world is seeing yet another full dis another display of that coercive power. Yet however successful the constant threat of U.S. military power may be in enforcing, quote, the global economy, the nature and capabilities of such a military power are completely at odds with capital's daily needs. High-tech bombing, however, quote, smart, is hardly designed to create the stable and predictable social order or the complex infrastructure required by capital in its daily affairs. The economic imperatives of capitalism could be said to have created a global order more integrated than ever before, maybe even a form of integration that for the first time constitutes what some would call a global society. 
But the social system that binds together a vast and varied array of social networks and national economies is of a very peculiar kind. There is nothing else in the history of humanity to compare with the kind of social system created by capitalism. A complex network of tight interdependence among large numbers of people and social classes not joined by personal ties or direct political domination, but connected by their market dependence and the market's imperative network of social relations and processes. This impersonal social system is uniquely capable of extending far beyond the reach of personal ties and direct domination. But to sustain, sustain this vast impersonal network requires close social and legal controls, such as those provided by the nation-state. It is hard to imagine a global society based on capitalist economic relations that could be sustained without a multitude of much more local powers of coercion and administration. At any rate, the development of a rudimentary global society is, and is likely to remain, far behind the contrary effect of capitalist integration. The formation of many unevenly developed economies with varied and social systems presided over by many nation states. The national economies of advanced capitalist societies will continue to compete with one another, while global capital, always based in one or another national entity, will continue to profit from uneven development. The differentiation of social conditions among national economies and the preservation of exploitable low-cost labor regimes, which have created the widening gap between rich and poor, so characteristic of globalization. So the capitalist economy has an irreducible need for extra economic supports whose spatial range can never match its economic reach. In the earliest days of capitalism, when England's domestic economy more or less coincided with its national political regime, there was no obvious disjunction between the economic reach of capital and the political-slash-jurisdictional reach of the nation-state. But both England's national dominion and its domestic economy began to extend their reach very early in the development of the English nation-state and English capitalism. The multinational character of the British Isles was already a major factor in the formation of the Tudor state, and England also sought ways of extending the reach of its economic imperatives beyond the capacities of its political and military dominion already in its early form of colonialism. The history of capitalist development since then, which has seen a proliferation of nation-states, has also been marked by a growing distance between the economic reach of capital and the political dominion of any single nation-state. That increasing disparity between the global economy and the territorial nation-state in no way signals the end of capitalism's need, however contradictory, for a spatially fragmented political and legal order. On the contrary, that contradiction results from the persistence of that need. And for the foreseeable future, it is most likely to be met by something like the nation-state. The strongest challenges to existing nation-states, to their boundaries or indeed to their very existence, are more likely to come from oppositional forces of various kinds than from the agents of capital or the impersonal forces of the market. At the same time, as long as global capital continues to depend on the support of local states, both in the imperial powers and in subordinate economies, the state will be an essential terrain of opposition, and the growing distance between global capital and its political supports 
will open up new spaces for resistance.